Good morning, guys, and welcome to our introductory lecture to the pediatric patient. There's a lot of things that we're going to discuss throughout this lesson, so let's go ahead and get started. We know that the ill or injured child presents special concerns for pre-hospital personnel or providers. Current research indicates that more than 20,000 pediatric deaths occur each year in the United States. Now, these leading causes of death are specific based on age. They include minor, uh, pardon me, they include motor vehicle collision, burns, drownings, and suicides along with homicides. These alarming facts become even more troublesome when experts theorize that many of them could have been prevented by early interventions. Tragedies involving children, neonates through adolescence, account for some of the most stressful calls and incidents that you will run on as an EMS provider. Now we also know that treatment of pediatric patients presents with a number of challenges as well. Children, especially young ones, often cannot describe what's bothering them or what's happened to them. In addition to the child patient, you must also deal with parents or caregivers. That alone can be stressful. Finally, a child's size makes routine procedures even more difficult, more challenging. Keep in mind that children are not just small adults. They have a very specialized component for considerations and needs. Throughout this lesson, we'll discuss these topics of pediatric emergencies and apply them to advanced pre-hospital care uh, as appropriate. Topics for this lesson include the role of the paramedic in pediatric care, a general approach to pediatric emergencies, a general approach to patient assessment for peds, and then how to manage uh, generic uh, pediatric calls. Let's go ahead and get started. We know that tragedies involving children are some of the most stressful incidents that you're going to encounter in your EMS practice. We know that children have a very difficult time describing what's actually bothering them or even what's happened to them. We also know that we have to deal with caregivers or parents that can make things even more challenging or more difficult. We know that child size plays a role as we've discussed, making it more difficult to do routine procedures, and that children truly are not just small adults. They have special considerations and needs that we need to identify. Now, current research indicates that, again, more than 20,000 pediatric deaths occur each year in the United States. This is noted on page 81 of your textbook, that 20,000 American children die annually from trauma. Now, these 20,000 deaths are, again, based on generic um, categories in which death would occur. Um, they include things like motor vehicle collisions, burns, drowning, suicides, and homicides. But motor vehicle collisions is the leading cause of pediatric death. It's about one-third of pediatric deaths. That's a lot of cases because of uh, motor vehicle collisions or inter inappropriate restraining devices, things of that nature. Let's dive into what the role of the paramedic is in pediatric care. There are two key concepts that we have to wrap our minds around. First, pediatric injuries have become a major concern. What parent is not concerned about the safety and well-being of their child? The second component we look at is children are at a higher risk for injury than that of adults. They're also unable to tolerate and maintain or compensate for injuries as long as adults. Kids typically will compensate, 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 crash. That's how they'll go. They don't have the energy reserves, the oxygen stores, the glucose reserves to be able to pull out uh, that long compensatory uh, factor as long as an adult can without eliminating uh, its ability to function properly. We also know that you as the paramedic need to get involved. Get involved in identifying and implementing methods and mechanisms that prevent injuries, right? You pull up to a stop site, stoplight, you look over and you see a two-year-old child who's running amok inside of the vehicle. What are you going to do? We know that that's not a safe way for children to be transported. We also know we're not law enforcement. We have to begin to navigate that thin line of what we do, what's right and safe for our patients, and how we go about implementing change. You can be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. We always say, they're just little adults, right? No, that's not the case. The pediatric centered education that you're going to receive is going to be crucial, not only in your initial education, but in your long-term career. Are you maintaining a good working knowledge of pediatrics? The My Peers study showed us that about 50% of the time, paramedics or at least maybe even over 50% of the time, paramedics are inappropriately dosing medications for pediatric patients. That's just not safe. That's just not safe. 
so we have some goals at which we need to seek out additional education, fill in any knowledge gaps that we may have. These include things like certification courses such as Pediatric Advanced Life Support or PALS, you'll get trained in this, PEP for Pediatric Education for Paramedic Professionals, APPLES, Advanced Pediatric Life Support, uh, PPC, which is the Pre-Hospital Pediatric Care, and then we also get a lot of these general theories on education for pediatrics in the center of pediatric medicine. It is critical that you stay versed in the pediatric patient. We don't see them very often, and because of that, we oftentimes don't focus our skills and training on pediatrics. But when we do get those calls, we have to be sharp. We have to make sure our skills are honed and prepared because there's nothing more stressful than a pediatric patient who's dying in front of you. When we think about continuing education and training, regional conferences and seminars are always a great way of increasing your knowledge of pediatric care. Um, again, if you don't use it, you will lose it, and knowledge is power in stressful emergencies. With today's technology, you can easily tap into online articles, or videos, or resources, anything of those of that nature that will help you maintain those current and crucial pediatric skills. If you have the capability, provide, uh, probably spend time in the pediatric emergency department or the pediatric hospital or any pediatric department for that matter. All of those things are going to help your exposure and help you gain better skills to provide in an emergency situation. Use your clinical opportunities this semester to your advantage. We also want to make sure that you see lots of pediatric patients. The more you see, the more you'll know. And visit pediatricians or talk with pediatric nurse practitioners. Talk with the folks that deal with peds every single day. They're going to be a great resource for you. We also know that healthcare injury prevention is very critical for us in EMS. The state of Michigan takes it so seriously they have a department within the Bureau of EMS and Trauma for Emergency Medical Services for Children, or the EMSC. Um, again, you can get directly to that <clears throat> website through the link that's provided above. And we know that it's a federally funded program, and the goal is, in essence, to improve the health of pediatric patients who suffer from life-threatening emergencies or illnesses, injuries, things that happen. It's a coordinated effort to identify areas of concerns across all branches of healthcare. We know that trauma registries and epidemiological research rely on pre-hospital provider documentation, your patient care reports. Those darn PCRs, again, they're always getting in the way but it's used for data collection, and so it's important for us to accurately document our ability and experiences within our PCRs for pediatrics. There's a lot of pediatric healthcare concerns. We know we have to worry about education in the community, data collection, quality improvement, injury prevention, access to pediatric care, pre-hospital care, emergency care, definitive care, there has to be some type of finance to help support that, a rehabilitation for those that need long-term care, and a systemic approach to pediatrics to maintain that ongoing health care. Well, where do we fit in? You can see that highlighted in purple. We are the majority of this. EMS plays a definitive role in pediatric care, not only in the pre-hospital setting, but throughout the health care system as a whole. It's our job to report concerns up to make sure that we help educate the community that we work together to make sure we have effective, accurate data collection, that we're constantly improving and reducing the likelihood of injuries, that we're making sure that there's access to both pre-hospital, emergency, and definitive care for peds, and that those need it, we get them help financially. Again, we have to recognize that this is a large, ongoing approach that EMS is drastically uh, interweaved in. Now, when we think about improved health care and injury prevention, we need to make sure that you take part in offering to organize um, or, or participating in, or, in organizing or teaching or whatever you want to call it, something that involves the community. Something that involves the community in a program, in injury prevention, in health care, you name it. Volunteer to speak, speak at a career day for your local high school. Uh, volunteer to conduct safety inspections um, on each call for a pediatric patient or not. One of the things that we look closely at is the dose training, direct on-scene education for our pediatric patients. Remember that these events that you're participating in can be fun. Kids learn about us in EMS, hopefully gather more interest in becoming an EMS provider of some sorts or in healthcare, and that it reinforces that we're there to help and also helps remove any fear of EMS providers during an emergency situation. All those things can help you affect pediatric injuries well before they occur.
We also know that most of the advanced life support and skills practiced in pediatrics are not advanced life support. 85% of children treated by EMS personnel need nothing more than basic life support skills. Goes back to that statement of a good EMT really does save your paramedic partner. You need to make sure your basic skills are honed and, and proficient. Um, typically, we say, hey, I got that stuff down pat, no problem. But it, remember that it truly is your contingency plan. If something goes wrong, you fall back onto those basic skills. Uh, it is fairly rare that a paramedic will be called upon to perform an advanced life support skill, but it can happen, right? Sometimes it is crunch time on occasion. So practice these skills as often as you can to maintain proficiency. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the general approach to pediatric emergencies. We again know that pediatric patients are not just small adults. Let's dive into that. Your approach will vary with the age of the patient and with the problem that you're treating. We're going to need to know what equipment you're utilizing, how are you going to be able to interact with that patient, uh, how, does it, how will they be able to communicate with you effectively, and what tools will I rely on most often, specifically with pediatric patient. I'm thinking primarily of your dosing or mimetic cards, or specific equipment for that matter. We also need to take into consideration the patient's emotional and physiological development. I'm not going to treat a teenage uh, female or male like I would treat a one-year-old. Uh, I'm not going to get very far with that approach. I also know that I need to involve the parents and caregivers more or less depending on the age of the patient, depending on the circumstance. For our young infants or school-age children, I may need to involve mom, dad, or the caregiver more often. With teenagers, I may need to avoid, uh, involve them less in order to get accurate information. All things we have to kind of judge and play by ear. We also know that you're still a stranger to the patient for the most part, and a lot of children have stranger danger, uh, which is totally normal and okay. We have to try to be able to breach that. And then we also have to recognize what is normal for that child before we decide to label them as abnormal. Again, we've got a lot of things and a lot of information that's going to be coming from our parents or caregivers as our only or only primary reliable source of information. With communication and physiological support, or probably psychological support, treatment begins with communication, right? We want to make sure that we're recognizing that effective communication builds trust, build trust, allows for us to provide better care. So interaction with the patient and caregiver must begin and continue throughout the call and throughout your assessment. We have to make sure that we're regularly involving them in that. These are going to be your experts on your patients, your parents or caregivers. They want to make sure the child is in good hands and by you involving them, it's going to allow for that trust factor to be built. We want to gather information about the patient's history as quickly and accurately as possible while still managing the patient during that process. Remember, we still have a job to do, and even though communication is at the forefront of that, life-saving interventions takes a higher priority. We also have to respond to the patient's need. The child's most common reaction to an emergency is fear. We have to try to eliminate that fear as best we can. So here's some of the common things that children will fear during a call. First, separation, right? Children like comfort. That's their safety. They like to know they're safe. If we can keep them comfortable, we can keep them safe. We can allow for better interactions and, and uh, skills and things of that are the call to happen normally. Removal of, uh, from a family place or from their home and that they're never going to return. Yeah, it may not be a logical conclusion for you as an adult, but as for a child or a schoolager, if they think they're leaving with a stranger, they may think they're never coming back. They're also afraid of being hurt. They know that when they go to the doctor, they're going to get things like shots, or immunizations, things that are going to hurt. We want to try to allevi alleviate as much of that fear as possible. right? Most of our teenagers, huge fear of being mutilated or disfigured because they have such a concern of being accepted or fitting in being able to fit into their social circle. And then obviously the fear of the unknown. When an emergency happens, everyone fears the unknown. We must recognize that it's our ability to calm and comfort the patient and family in a time of an emergency. And that again, we need to be the duck, smooth, glassy, sliding across the top of the water while our minds and emotions are, are flopping below, paddling like crazy but we must be able to keep the, uh, the control of the situation to provide the best care for that patient. And recognizing the fears that children have is the first step of that. We also know that we need to be honest with our communication. Children have the right to know what's being done to them. 
It doesn't mean that we are going to go ahead and just tell them, look, I'm going to hurt you with an IV. But we're going to need to explain things to them uh, that are going to make sense for their level of understanding. Try to be as honest as possible as you can and use language that's appropriate for the child. You're not going to tell a child that you're going to establish uh, an intravenous line uh, with an angiocath, 20 gauge catheter, and they're left in a cubicle. That's going to scare the crap out of them. If we were to say, I'm going to take and put a straw into your arm, it's going to be one quick poke, right? And I'm going to put a rubber band on your arm that's going to help give it a hug. And my stethoscope is like a big speaker that we can listen to what your body is doing. Those terms, those approaches are going to get you a lot farther than using medical terminology. And that's across the board, truly regardless of age. And remember that with any patient, especially pediatrics, if you lose trust, you may lose your patient. Losing trust with your patient can kill. Now, responding to parents and caregivers, the initial reaction to an emergency will vary across the spectrum. Everything from shock and grief to anger, guilt, fear, or a complete loss of all control and faculties. This could be for your patient. This could be for your caregiver. This could be for both. It's our job to make sure that we don't fall into that reaction category. Remember, communication, as always, is essential. Allow one of the parents or caregivers to remain with the child. Yes, you're going to have company policies on this, and you're going to have to navigate that policy. But when it's in the child's best interest, make sure that the caregiver is there with them. If it's going to help keep them calm, let's do it. In a case of pediatric epiglottitis, a child crying almost can immediately occlude that airway through the swelling of the epiglottis. We don't want to make things worse in that circumstance. So keeping mom or caregiver or father, whoever's there, with the child to keep them comfortable, that's really, really important. Because without that, that can mean the difference between life and death and epiglottitis. So again, we have to navigate that gray zone. We also know that we must maintain an index of suspicion to injuries that are questionable in nature. I always say this to you guys. Keep full batteries in your BSO meter. When the BSO meter is screaming that this is nothing but a bunch of dookie, we want to be able to recognize that. And listen to your gut. Remember, what you do in that moment determines the patient outcome and determines how effective your care will be in the relationship you have in that very short period of time with that caregiver. Don't make things worse for your patient by blowing up or using emotions that you shouldn't be using in that circumstance. What to do, what not to do. What to do. Tell them your name and your qualifications. That's important. Be a professional. Treat them like a professional would. That's how you build your first line of trust. Acknowledge their fears and concern. Again, don't talk down to them, but help lift them up. Help bridge the gap between what you need to do and, and their fear. And do what you can to minimize that. Reassure them that it's all right to feel the way that they're feeling. It's valid for their emotions to be concerned or upset. And redirect their energy towards helping you with care for their child. Again, if we can give mom or dad a task to do, oftentimes that will keep them focused, it'll keep them engaged, and keeping them moving forward. We also want to make sure that we remain calm and appear in control of the emergency. We know oftentimes we walk into shit shows and there's nothing you're going to do to fix that child or save uh, that life or, or stop the progression of any, of any one track uh, process. But you need to remain in control. Remember, when an ambulance shows up and a paramedic gets out, the emergency is over. It's really about how you handle that call and your demeanor that delineates the direction that that call is going to go in there. You can freak out on the inside. We all do. But like a duck swimming on the water, we need to make sure that we're cool and calm as we slide across that clean, glassy surface. And again, assure parents and caregivers everything possible is being done for their child. Keep them there with you. Don't kick them out of the room. Let them be there as part of resuscitation. Let them be there for the care. Not only does that help build trust, it also allows for them to see that you truly are doing everything possible for their child. Growth and development. There is a lot of milestones that happen between birth and becoming an adult. Um, some of us have had the opportunity to live through that as we've had our own children. I know my perspectives have changed on this in the last couple of years with my two young ones at home. Uh, but it is important still for us to recognize their growth and development. Those milestones are important for us to recognize how we interact with those children to 
improve their patient care. Uh, a newborn is defined as a child that's um, from birth, right, the first few hours after birth, we would consider them to be a newborn or a neonate. Uh, oftentimes you'll see those terms used uh, interchangeably. But a newborn is really just always after the first few hours of birth. Again, we use the assessment method rubric of the APGAR score, which we've talked quite uh, significantly about. And then we use that uh, inverted pyramid, as we talked about in our previous lesson, uh, starting with our basic things and moving into our more advanced care for neonatal resuscitation. A neonate, again, is defined uh, from birth to one month. They tend to lose, believe it or not, about 10% of their birth weight within 10 days. I didn't think that was that common or that important until I had my first child. And then I was like, yeah, we, we've got us a big girl here. She's <laughs> healthy and, and really doing well. And she started to lose some weight within the first couple of days after birth. There's so many physiological processes that are starting for them to maintain on their own. They're going to consume a lot of glucose. They're going to consume a lot of energy, uh, muscle mass, things of that nature. So um, be prepared for that, right? Don't be surprised that they can lose 10% of their body weight within 10 days. That's pretty drastic. Uh, they're going to have uh, development for centers and reflexes, right? So things like the ability to grab your hand, the palmar reflex, um, different things of that nature. We know that their personality, believe it or not, begins to form. It continues to form as they get older, but it does start right from the beginning as a neonate. And then mother, occasionally father, uh, really can comfort the child. Typically, um, children are more focused on, on the primary caregiver, whether that be mom or dad, um, from birth. APGAR score, just one more time so we can take a look at it. Table 2-2 two, two in your book. Again, it's a score of 0, 1, or 2. 2 is great, 1 is okay, and 0 is bad. And so we got to kind of rank them on appearance, pulse rate, grimace, or their irritability, uh, muscle tone or activity, and then the respiratory effort. Uh, again, typically a score less than 7 is a bad bad day for that kid. Um, or probably not less than seven, less than uh, six is typically a, a concern. Um, a seven to ten indicates an active, vigorous newborn. A six to four indicates a moderately distressed newborn. Anything less than four is a bad day. Um, and they're going to need immediate resuscitation. So again, uh, most of your OB kits will have an APGAR score on them. If not, take 10 seconds and print one off. And then every time you have, pull a new OB kit, you can take a stack of those and just tape them right to the bag. You'll, be, you'll thank yourself later on because when you have to reference these, um, oftentimes we don't have access to it, or you have to pull your phone out and you got slimy, sticky, uh, amniotic fluid hands. We'll call it that. Here's that inverted pyramid we've talked about as well. You can see it starts off with more basic skills and gets smaller based on the limited need for advanced procedures. We're going to start off by basically drying, warming, positioning, suctioning, and doing tactile stimulation. Remember, most of the time suctioning is not indicated, even for that of minor meconium. But we definitely are going to need to make sure the airway is clear. Oxygenation is important, especially if we're seeing that heart rate fall below 100 or they're having difficulties in, in their grimace or activity. And then uh, bag valve mass ventilations are important for any child that has a rest, uh, heart rate less than 100. Chest compressions, if the heart rate falls less than 60. Beyond that, we know airway is one of the most critical things we can do and that pediatric patients are very dependent on oxygenation, and so innovation takes precedence over medications. Now with neonates, serious illness is difficult to distinguish from minor illness because they're so small, everything generally looks the same. We see any fever in a neonate, that's gonna require an extensive evaluation. We know that a fever is not normal for a neonate. Um, we know we always need to keep them warm, regardless of a fever or not, but there's a lot of common illnesses, and these include things like jaundice, where they get the yellowing of the skin, um, vomiting or respiratory distress. And a lot of these problems are going to be associated with body systems that are still developing. They have not yet fully developed. A lot of times, the only symptom we really may be able to see, again, they can't describe what's going on to us. But the only thing we may see is a fever. And a fever may be the only sign you see in some of the more critical uh, uh, emergencies, including things like meningitis, or other serious illnesses. The patient may not be able to maintain their own body temperature appropriately, and we know that these, these folks are dependent on us for survival, right? Um, mom or caregiver uh, in general care. So we must make sure that they're protected from the environment because they don't have the ability to thermoregulate like an adult would. We also want to allow the parent, uh, prime patient to remain in the caregiver's lap. It's going to make them the most comfortable. It's going to make it the easiest for us to be able to assess. And with any neonate, fluid in, fluid out is crucial. 
How much fluid have they been taking in? Neonates are going to be consuming primarily liquid diet of formula or breast milk. And with those components, are they getting enough fluid in? Do they not want to drink? And then are they still producing fluid out? Are they urinating? Do they have wet diapers? Have they had excessive diarrhea? Uh, do they cry and have no tears? Do they now have dry diapers? All these components, sunken in eyes, sunken in fontanels, all of those components are going to be signs of dehydration. Dehydration will kill a neonate uh, or at least complicate things drastically. Um, again, a lack of absence or tears when crying may indicate dehydration. Uh, often parents say, well, geez, you know, the kid was having uh, lots and lots of diarrhea, and then it all of a sudden just stopped. And there's no urine output, there's no diarrhea, there's no tears. All those signs are a grave concern for serious dehydration. Now, as we go from a neonate to an infant, now we're from one month of age to the first five months. Um, that's what we're going to talk about first. They're going to double their birth weight by five to six months of age. Their muscle control begins to develop. They have the ability to move their head to toes, their trunks, their fingertips. They have all those different components. They also can move and follow with their eyes. Patient um, is to be kept warm and comfortable as often as we can. That's the goal of every new parent is, uh, or parent in general is to make sure their child is warm and comfortable. And then again, focus on the parent or the caregiver for information because we're not going to get much out of a one-month-old. Um, and then remember, accidents, illness, and history of pregnancy and complications all are things that we want to include in our assessment. We know that some of them is the first uh, problem that we're going to see with a body system issue, maybe a congenital issue, is going to be after birth. And so knowing what complications, what illnesses, accidents, anything that happened during the pregnancy or, or after uh, during that child's life, we need to know about. From 6 to 12 months, now they may stand or walk without assistance. Uh, this, again, is a spectrum. Children move across the spectrum on their own pace uh, individually. So, But generally speaking, they may stand or walk without assistance. Um, most are just learning to crawl, I would probably say. They typically are quite active, and they explore everything through their sense of taste, through their mouth. Everything goes in their mouth. That puts a big risk on foreign body airway obstructions uh, as a serious concern. Their tongue, is, in their minds, is still a tool. It's a tool for sensory components. Um, they express, express themselves pretty regularly at this point with stranger anxiety or stranger danger. They prefer the comfort of their mom, dad, or caregiver. And common illnesses and injuries include things like febrile seizures, where they get a rapid rise, or rapid fall for that matter, predominantly rapid rise in fever over a very short period of time, causing seizure activity in the brain, um, vomiting or diarrhea, all leads to dehydration, bronchiolitis, inflammation of the bronchioles, croup, poisonings, the foreign body airway obstructions like we talked about, could be an accident, a fall, or it could be some type of serious infection like meningitis. We also know that we need to examine while they're sitting in the lab with the parent or caregiver, right? We call that a POC, is parent or caregiver. And we typically are going to do a toe-to-head assessment rather than a head-to-toe. It's the opposite, as you can see in the image. It's less threatening. Kids are used to having their toes played with and that type of stuff, and their feet smelled and all that goofy stuff that goes with having kids. Um, but it's definitely important that we do that. Uh, they're also going to know that they have a more fu fully formed personality, and they are, have considerable anxiety towards, these, towards uh, strangers, especially at that one-year moment. Now, by th age one to three, now these guys are becoming toddlers. They've got great strides in motor development, right? We all know the saying of, of uh, the terrible twos. The old 99 monkeys jumping on the bed, one falls off, breaks their head, and they have to call an ambulance, right? Because they've got all this energy and they're exploring their bodies, those, all those components. Um, so things to kind of keep in mind there. They may start to stray away from their parents more frequently. We've all heard that uh, echo over the, the PA system at Meyer of Mrs. Smith, please report to the courtesy desk, we found your child. Um, <laughs> that does happen to everybody uh, because it's it's a concern. These kids are, are exploring the world. Um, oftentimes, the parents still are the only ones that truly can comfort them when they are uh, upset. Language development begins uh, at this point in, uh, of age. They begin to understand uh, better than they actually can speak. So they can understand what you're saying, but they may not be able to repeat it back to you or uh, complete it. Believe it or not, you know how old Einstein was before he spoke? I think he was almost four or five by the time he started to speak. We have to look that up again. But uh, Einstein, as smart as he was, he didn't speak uh, at one to three. Um, accidents are leading cause of injury. 
right? Similar to that of older infants. You know, accidents are the biggest thing. They're exploring. Um, in this case, it could be trauma. It could be any chemical exposure. It could be any type of accident that would cause injury. We also know that they still are examined from toe to head, right? Because, again, we want to build that trust, and we don't want to go right in uh, for their chest or abdomen where they may be having injuries or pain or putting our cold stethoscope on them. Start with what they can assess, what they'll let you assess, with their foot or their hand. Pulse oximetry is a great tool to get started with on that. Um, they are looking for acceptance, um, and they're going to always respond how you want them to respond or how they think you want a response. They want to please. So avoid yes or no questions, right? Um, that's, uh, that's the best way that we get my daughter to see if she understands that, too. We ask her, um, you know, Claire, what do you got going on? What do you need? Um, do you want a popsicle? Yes. Do you want dog food? Yes. Do you want a can of spinach? Yes. Okay. Clearly, she's not hungry for one thing or another. She just is saying yes to say yes. Um, it's a, a, a great way of uh, avoiding those yes or no questions is to um, try to uh, allow the child to tell you what's going on. Try to get them to communicate as best as they can and know that they can understand you much better uh, than they can communicate. Trust, trust, trust. Get the kid into their comfort zone. Give them a favorite blanket or a favorite toy. Maybe give them a blanket or a toy. Let them utilize your stethoscope. Um, all those things need to be done you know, with uh, proper cleaning and disinfecting of things that we're giving to the child. But we want to involve them uh, as much as we can to build their confidence. We also know that if something is going to hurt, you're going to need to tell them it's going to hurt. It's okay. Let them have their emotions. But that's a trust component. You don't want to say, well, it's not going to hurt, and then you stick a needle under their arm. Uh, you're going to lose their ability uh, to work with you at, on anything at that point. From ages three to five, now we're in preschoolers. This, again, we're increasing fine and gross motor skills. They like to climb. They like to be exploring. Uh, they know how to talk. They may not talk to strangers very much, but they do know how to talk. And they may tell you something and just uh, out of the blue randomly and interrupt your assessment. They have a thought and they have to get it out immediately. Um, they do have a fear of mutilation, right? So they're concerned about what it's going to look like or how well they're going to be in the future. They may not be able to predict very far or anticipate long-term issues, but they are concerned about their their, their figure. Um, they again seek comfort and support within the home. And they have a very weird, distorted sense of time, right? They're asking a lot of whys, how much longer. You know, you say 30 minutes, they go, okay, five seconds later, how much longer? It's still 30 minutes. They just don't recognize that time travels, uh, how, how fast time travels, I should say. Common injuries uh, and illnesses that you see in preschoolers, there's a lot of them. They include things like croup, asthma. Again, those are very concerning because they are, again, respiratory in nature. Poisonings because they are exploring and they're putting everything in their mouth still. Auto accidents uh, from, uh, in general, it could be uh, uh, car versus pedestrian um, or improper restraining devices, burns, child abuse, um, ingestion of foreign bodies, drowning, epiglottitis, another big one we talked about as far as airway, febrile seizures, and meningitis, another big one for concern when it comes to uh, infectious disease. Treatment of preschoolers uh, requires tact. you got to be able to kind of navigate where that kid is on their development spectrum. Don't do baby talk. Um, kids, no one deserves to be talked to like a baby besides maybe a baby. Um, a five-year-old, talk to him like you would talk to a normal five-year-old. Keep it simple. Um, don't complicate it, but be direct. Don't trick or lie to him, right? Be honest about what's going to happen. Allow the child to hold a piece of equipment, like a stethoscope. Got to make sure it's clean, but that's something they can do. And maybe they can even perform an assessment with your stethoscope on a doll or toy of their own. That will help you, again, build that trust factor. In this case, we can start the examination with the chest, right? We can go a little bit more towards the core central. But remember, their head should be the last. So we're working our way up from the toes. Now we're at the chest with a 3- to 5-year-old. Um, we're not going to approach the head until we're into an older great age group. And then again, explain what you're doing. Because the more that you explain, the more they're going to trust what's going on. Six to 12 year olds, um, they are active and carefree. They are having a great time. They're living the life. Uh, their parents are often their hero. They're going to grow through growth spurts, which leads to major issues with their coordination abilities. And so that means they're more prone to accidents. 
Um, given responsibility, providing history is to the patients now, so we can ask them for information. We may need, still need to verify some stuff with mom or dad, because again, oftentimes children will repeat what they want you to hear, not necessarily what's the truth. But they do respect modesty. They know that they have uh, privates and that, that those are meant to be maintained and covered. And when we have to do certain procedures uh, or assessments, we may have to recognize that uh, their modesty does exist and we may have to kind of explain that or have some guidance from the parent or caregiver. Common injuries and illnesses for school age children, drownings, accidents, uh, bicycle accidents, falls, fractures, sport injuries, child abuse, and burns. All again, you can see trauma, 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 trauma. Again, because of the coordination issues that they have uh, and because of how active they are for their age group, we see a lot of traumatic injuries. Adolescents, this is 13 to 18. Um, they are very, very body conscious. They are concerned about fear. They're concerned about, uh, the, well, they'll have fear, I should say. They're going to be very anxious uh, or, or fearful of any treatment or injury that hurts, right? If it hurts, they are really concerned about it still. Um, they may consider themselves to be grown-ups and uh, interact with us as grown-ups, but oftentimes they're still not mature uh, mentally. We know that they have a desire to be included, to be liked by their peers. They generally are pretty good historians, just depending on who's around. And we know that relationships, part of that uh, history, if relationships are strained with their parent or caregiver, um, they may group you with their parents, or they may also uh, just not want to give information if the parent or guardian is present. Remember, interact with them as adults. Treat them like adults. If you treat them like an adult, they're going to react in a much better way than if you treat them like a child. Common injuries. Mono. Mononucleosis is one of the big ones we see, right? The kissing disease. They're starting to kiss everybody. <laughs> Asthma. Uh, exercise or activity-related injuries. Auto accidents, especially as they're rolling your drive. Uh, they are inexperienced with a lot of things, so they are more likely to have traumatic injuries or illnesses because of that. Sport injuries. They now start to play around with drugs and alcohol. They have attention, abuse, and uh, acceptance issues. We also see suicidal gestures and sexual abuse that's common in this age group. Remember, treat these guys like adults, be conscious of who's around them, um, and still remember that they are children. Even though we're going to treat them like adults, they are still pediatric patients. Anatomy and physiology. There's a four primary core things we have to remember when we're thinking about A&P for peds. One, children are not simply small adults. They have healthier organs, they are softer and more flexible tissue, and they have a greater ability to compensate for most illnesses, but then they will crash. An adult's generally going to come and have you sick and get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, and then, now, oh, now they're dead. The pediatric patient's going to compensate and compensate and compensate and compensate, and I've used all of my resources. Now they're dead. Now they crash. And it's very hard to get up back uh, on top of where they need to be because we're now behind the eight ball. Anatomical and physiological characteristics of infants and children. You guys can take a look at these uh, on your own. You're going to see their tongue is more larger than, uh, proportionally larger, more likely to block the airway. Smaller airway structures, again, they're easier to block. Uh, lots and lots of secretions. Again, airway, airway, airway. Um, they've got baby teeth, which can become dislodged, block the airway, flat nose and face, difficult to get a seal for managing an airway. Head is heavier than the body. Uh, less muscle structures makes it more difficult for us to be able to get things taken care of in that nature. Again, we can see that we have funnel and other structures, uh, soft spots that are going to be more palpable on the child's head. Um, again, we know that bulging funnels is going to be a sign of increased intracranial pressure. Um, maybe normal, the infant's crying though. Oftentimes we think, geez, that's, that's a crazy, crazy case, but it could solely be just because of them crying. Sunken fontanelles are going to increase uh, likelihood of dehydration. Thinner, softer brain tissue, more serious brain injuries when trauma occurs. Larger head proportion to the body makes it more difficult to get an airway seal uh, and again maintain that neutral alignment because their giant melon heads are so big. It's like a giant bowling ball on a pencil for a neck. Um, shorter, narrower, more elastic, uh, flexible trachea. That's why we can, if we do hyperextension, we can actually occlude the trachea. Shorter neck, harder to stabilize. And they're abdominal breathers, right? Which means it's harder for us to evaluate the breathing uh, inside the abdomen, or breathing uh, uh, for abdominal injuries. 
Uh, we see a faster respiratory rate, so they become more fatigued, uh, again, causing respiratory stress earlier. Newborns, again, are predominantly nose breathers, so if their nose is, is any type of blockage or secretions, again, that can lead to lack of oxygenation and hypoxia. Larger body surface area related to body mass, that means they're more prone to hypothermia. Uh, they're going to be hard to maintain proper heat. Softer bones, that's actually not too bad. It gives them a little bit more flexibility when it comes to traumatic forces, but the bones may not break, but the energy will get transferred from the bone into the organs. So now we're looking at organ issues rather than just a fracture like you would see with an adult. Again, lungs are very easy to damage. Airway-related issue, bad problem for a patient to have. Spleen and liver, more exposed. Because they're more exposed, they're more likely to have um, significant forces applied to them when we're talking about trauma, and they lead to bleeding. Again, there's a lot of things that we see when it comes to anatomy and physiology, but remember, remember that regardless of the situation, we must not treat a ped like an adult. We must look more deeply. We must look uh, and be very thorough with our assessment to make sure we're not missing anything that on an adult would just be glazed over. When we think about the head, um, the head, I'm kind of bring these in here. The head um, is going to be small, uh, probably large head, small face, difficult to maintain a seal on the bag above mass. Fontanels or soft spots are there. Uh, we see heavy headed, uh, uh, at least the size and weight comparison to the body is very high. That's why they're more likely to tip over and hit their head first. Uh, again, increasing the risk of trauma. Positioning the airway techniques, if the patient's less than three, we want to try to pad between the shoulders. If they're over the age of three, pad under the occipital lobe, the lower portion of the posterior skull, and to get them back into that sniffing position. The goal is generally to maintain a neutral alignment for your patient. With the airway, we know that patients are going to have a much narrower airway, which means they're more likely to get blocked by foreign bodies or even secretions, even swelling for that matter. We know that they're obligated nose breathers, so they may not be, they're so young, they may not be able to know, oh, my nose is stuff, breathe through my mouth. They're going to try to breathe through their nose. Any secretions, you've seen a sick kid, they get lots of nasty goobers in their nose. Makes it very difficult for them to breathe. Again, larger proportional tongue, especially it's about it's almost the same size as an adult tongue, uh, believe it or not. It will grow a little bit more, but the opening, the, the pharyng oral pharyngeal area, uh, is much more compact in a child than it is an adult. Meaning the tongue is going to take up more space, more likely for some type of obstruction. Trachea is softer, more flexible, can collapse uh, with hyperextension of the neck or the head, right? Think of the baby or the CPR mannequins you have, you overdo them, right? Air may still go in, in a real person, that may not be the case. We have to maintain that neutral alignment, ear to sternal notch. Airway, the larynx is higher, it's also more anterior, meaning when you're trying to innovate, it's in the worst position. It's up here when you're trying to innovate a child this way, you have to look up. For an adult, maybe you have to look down. Um, the cricoid ring is the narrowest part of the airway where most things will get stuck, making it even harder for us to get them out. And again, they're going to have more of an omega-shaped or where you like shape uh, epiglottis. It's floppier, it's larger, and it can be a big issue if it becomes infected um, or inflamed. Most of your management principles for airway are the same. Keep the nares cleared on infant that's less than six months of age because we know they're predominantly nose breathers. So use your bulb suction device to clear their nose. Don't overextend the neck. That keeps their airway open. And utilize basic maneuvers uh, for airway maintenance. It's the most effective uh, tool you can have, right? It may be effective, believe it or not, without additional airway adjuncts. With the chest and lungs, infants and children are diaphragmatic breathers. They're belly breathers. The pediatric patient is also going to be more prone to gastric distension, right? Kids drinking a big bottle and they're sucking it down real fast. They have a tendency to swallow air, right? It gets that gastric distension. Uh, they also do this when they breathe and when they cry very heavily or very forcefully. Anything with gastric distension can lead to major issues with pushing up on the diaphragm and making their ability to breathe in a full volume of tidal volume uh, less effective. Rib fractures, again, occur less frequently. No, pardon me, less, less frequently. Um, and again, there's a lot more cartilage there, so it's easier for them to compress, but it can transmit that energy into the organs beneath, especially to the lung tissue. Things like pulmonary contusions or lacerated liver or spleen are very common um, when we're dealing with the uh, uh, chest and abdomen. Lungs are more prone to that of adults for pneumothorax. 
especially following borrow trauma. They are thinner, less developed tissue. They have less elasticity. So very easy for a child to have that uh, paper bag syndrome where they pop up, pop their lungs and develop a spontaneous pneumothorax. We know that the mediastinum also is going to be the area around the, where the heart is located is more likely to shift with attention pneumothorax than an adult because again, their tissue is more easily compressed. Breast sounds are even harder to hear because everything is so close together. Um, we may need to use a smaller stethoscope uh, or we may need to use the opposite side, the smaller uh, diaphragm um, on our regular stethoscopes for an adult if you have it. Abdomen, we talked about the liver and the spleen both being very vascular organs are proportionally larger. Everything in the abdominal cavity is squished together. So the more squished together it is, the bigger risk we have of injury to that area. Again, there's less protection because the abdominal wall is less developed as it protects the organs. And again, everything is so closely together, it's more likely that uh, generic injury can lead to some major organ trauma. In the extremities, we know that their bones are softer and more porous. Uh, we treat sprains and strains as fractures because we may not actually be able to see a compound fracture or a clean fracture like you would see with an adult. Typically, we're going to see green stick fractures. Uh, if I were to go out and cut a tree down, a branch off a tree right now and try to break it, it's going to start to bend and then it's going to kind of flake uh, out. That's an example of trying to snap a green stick from a tree. That's how kids' bones will fracture. They don't completely break, but it kind of begins to tear and deteriorate apart. Uh, with that ex external trauma. We know that we want to be very conscious of injuries to the growth plate, as you can see is identified uh, by the arrow here on the PowerPoint slide. Uh, anything, that, especially when we're doing an interosseous infusion or placing an IO, we go too high up, you're going to affect that growth plate. That's where more bone is made and produced. And if we affect that growth plate, we're going to have a big problem with the uh, child's leg potentially stopping to grow on that side. And that's just never a good case. Now, body skin and surface area is important. There's three distinguishing factors that we have to identify. First, the skin is thinner, there's less subcutaneous fat, and there's an increased body surface area to weight ratio. This puts children at a greater risk from injuries in extreme temperature or thermal exposures, including that of burns. With the respiratory system, the tidal volume is proportionally similar to that of an adolescent or an adult. However, their metabolic needs is double that of what you would see in an adolescent or an adult. They have to have that oxygen. Consider their heart rate and their respiratory rate. Normal respiratory rate for a child is about 30. An adult is 12 to 20. So you can see right away that they're gonna breathe faster because they need to consume more oxygen. Their heart rate is faster because they have to work harder to move that oxygen around. All those things are great to help the child develop, but they're not necessarily the best factors to have when we're dealing with the child who needs to compensate from some type of injury or trauma or illness. Um, we know that infants are at a very high risk for hypoxia. Again, that's an increase in metabolic demand and they cannot tolerate hyperventilation or slow breathing for very long at all. That's why kids will compensate, 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 psh, crash. That's a big concern we have. Uh, it's also part of the reason why we make sure that when we're doing a neonatal resuscitation, we're doing that three to one, right? Three compressions, one ventilation rather than doing a 15 or a 30 to two like you would with an adult. Cardiac output uh, is gonna be rate dependent for our cardiovascular system. We know that they possess vigorous but limited cardiovascular reserves, so it's hard for them to be able to compensate. They have an absolute blood volume that's smaller than that of adult. What appears to be a small amount of blood really may be a serious problem for the pediatric patient. They can maintain a blood pressure uh, like they can with an adult, actually believe it or not, longer than an adult, but they can still be at risk of shock. So we have to recognize it earlier than we would for an adult and know that kids will compensate, 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 crash. So suspect shock if tachycardia is present. That's extremely important. Their nervous system, it's gonna continuously develop throughout childhood. It remains very fragile. It's immature until truly they're about age five or even a little bit older. Bony structures are gonna be less uh, provide less protection of that of the brain and the spinal cord. And because those bony uh, structures are more flexible uh, and there's less calcification of the bone, uh, energy can easily get transmitted uh, into those organs. Again, higher possibility of damage to the tissues and the systems, but they may look fine, right? They may not have bruising or fractures, but they could seriously have internal uh, organ damage. 
Metabolic differences, infants and children have a limited stores of glycogen and glucose. They don't have a backup store. Remember that glycogen is the stores of sugar that are kept in the liver, that when they give glucagon, they are released and the glycogen is turned into a usable form of sugar. Pediatric patients are prone to hypothermia because they're increase in body weight, or probably increase in body surface area compared to weight. And we see significant volume loss that can result from vomiting and diarrhea, even for a short period. And remember how we can tell this. Things like sunken eyes, uh, sunken fontanels, uh, crying with no tears, dry diapers. Uh, newborns and neonates lack the ability also to shiver. So they can't generate their own heat, so they're dependent on being taken care of. So they must be protected from their environment, regardless if they're having an emergency or not. Now let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about our assessment, our general approach we have for our pediatric patient. Some basic considerations. First, much of the initial assessment can be done visually, right? Um, uh, as you are approaching the scene, as you make contact with the patient, right, we would consider this your general impression, your assessment from the doorway. We know that we want to involve the caregiver as much as possible. Why? Well, they're going to be the ones that are going to give us the most information. They're the best historian. We also allow for them to stay with the child during treatment and transport as much as possible because it's just better for everyone involved. First thing for scene size up is one, conduct the same quick scene size up that you normally would, paying attention to surroundings, condition, child-related hazards. Two, look for clues on mechanism of injury or nature of illness. Is there a presence of dangerous uh, substances, strange fumes or odors that you may notice? Is there any environmental hazards or evidence of child abuse? And three, allow child time to adjust to you before you approach. Let them see you and interact with their guardian, if able, and allow them to see you and know that you are okay in the eyes of the guardian, that the guardian gives the permission for you to, to care for their child. Your primary assessment really is going to switch. We typically think of an airway breathing circulation approach to our primary assessment, which is great for an adult. We have to optimize that and kind of alter it a little bit for a pediatric patient. Hence the pediatric assessment triangle. The pediatric assessment triangle says that all components for a child to be healthy and well, and well need to be working simultaneously. If we take one of the sides of the pyramid out, everything will collapse, meaning that the patient is more likely to deteriorate rapidly. Let's take a look at this. We know the pediatric assessment triangle is a way of quickly evaluating the level of severity and the need for immediate intervention. We do this based on an ABC approach, but from that of an adult, it is different. The A stands for appearance. We're looking at things like normal tone. Uh, is there a decrease in interactiveness, a decrease in consolability, an, an abnormal or look or gaze or an abnormal speech or cry? How do they appear? Breathing is our B. We look at work of breathing. Do they have abnormal sounds, abnormal positions, retraction, flaring, apnea, or gasping? And then circulation. What is the circulation to the skin? Do they have polar modeling, cyanosis, and so on? We have to recognize there are some vital functions we still need to make sure that we're obtaining. Those include things like level of consciousness, airway, breathing, and circulation assessment and management but the PAT will provide you an, a great alternative to truly assessing the need for immediate intervention. Now, one of the things that you'll find in your book, this is again going to be in your AHA PALS manual on page 29 and 30, uh, also is from your book, but when you look at the basics of pediatric assessment, your initial assessment is really going to have to do with the elements of the pediatric assessment triangle to make sure that those are all uh, in working order as we talked about, remembering that if one side of the path falls out, the child is more likely to have a serious uh, deterioration. From there, we're going to go ahead and take a look at their appearance and mental status. Um, we can use uh, an alternative to AVPU when we're dealing with um, uh, the alert and verbal component of our uh, assessment for mental status. We use tickles. Uh, tickles include things like tone, it's an acronym again, tone, uh, uh, interaction, consolability, look, gaze, speech, and cry. Um, we also know that we can use the, the PU portion of AVPU uh, as either they're unresponsive to pain or they're unresp probably responsive to pain or unresponsive in general. Um, we know that the work of breathing we talked about, that's that the PAT is used um, from across the room. We're going to get an assessment of what's going on, abnormal airway or breathing sounds, hoarseness, muffled speech, 
grunting, wheezing, strider, crowing, any of those components. Um, abnormal body positioning, uh, stiffening position, tripoding, refusing to lay down. We may also see physical signs like retractions, nasal flaring, seesaw breathing, um, or head bobbing. You see any infants are waking hard to keep, stay awake or uh, stay conscious. Uh, once we are get, again, we're going to perform the up uh, the across the room, and then we're going to perform an up close assessment. That includes things like listening with the stethoscope, both sides of the chest, anterior and posterior. Circulation, we're going to look at their skin color. Again, that's going to help us determine the severity. And then up close, I'm feeling for pulses, brachial, femoral, um, peripheral pulses, calf refill, uh, and children that are five years or younger. And then assess blood pressure in children that are three years and older. From there, I'm going to go ahead and move on to my history and physical exam, paying attention to common medical problems, including things like airway obstruction, respiratory emergencies, seizures, altered mental status, fever, poisoning, shock, near drowning, and then sudden infant death uh, syndrome or SIDS. Common trauma situations as well include things like seatbelt injuries, bicycle uh, related injuries, car versus pedestrian injuries, head and neck injuries, burns, and then cases of abuse and neglect. So how do you tell if breathing is compromised? Well, just like we would with an adult, we're going to look at respiratory rate. Too fast or too long leads to a tired patient. A decrease in respiratory rate is not always a good thing. Remember, the kids are dependent on that high rate and high heart rate in order to have adequate oxygenation of the tissues. So watch for too fast or too slow of a respiratory rate. We also know, how do you tell if breathing is compromised? Well, we're going to look at both things like respiratory effort, where we're assessing for chest rise, breath sound, strider, or wheezing. And then we're going to also use that with increased breathing effort, we're going to assess for things like nasal flaring or accessory muscle use. Respiratory distress in a child or infant, uh, any pediatric patient, is defined as any physical symptoms of, of difficulty in breathing. That can mean nose flaring alone is a sign of respiratory distress. In an adult, nasal flaring may not be a sign of severe respiratory distress, but it is in a pediatric patient. We have to watch those things. The use of accessory muscles, uh, intercostal muscles, substernal retractions, things of that nature. We need to make sure we expose the chest to take a look at the pediatric patient because we're not going to get a good picture of exactly what's going on unless we look for those symptoms. For color, cyanosis is a fairly late sign of respiratory failure, so we don't pay attention to cyanosis as, as much as we do other signs. Um, seen best in the mucous membranes and in the mouth or the nail beds if when you do look for it, and cyanosis of extremities alone is more likely due to shock rather than a respiratory problem. Recognize that color is important, but any sign of alterations in skin color it should be a major concern for you as a provider. For compromised breathing, we see a lot of things. Where we see the child beginning to act abnormal or have an altered mental status, nasal flaring, uh, pale or bluish lips or the mouth and the mucous membranes, strider or grunting, breathing rate that's greater than 60 a minute, muscle retractions, um, or during to increase respiratory effort. We see work uh, wheezing or increased work of breathing or even a struggle to breathe, decreased muscle tone, poor perfusion, and then the use of abdominal muscles to help offset uh, the ability of the uh, thoracic cavity. We need to make sure we're also prepared to anticipate cardiac arrest in children. Here's some of those core things we look for. First is respiratory rate greater than 60, heart rate greater than 180, or less than 80 for those that are under 5, a heart rate greater than 180 or less than 60 if they're over the age of 5, and respiratory distress. Those are not major things, but they're things that are going to have to stand out to you that you're going to recognize this patient is at a very high risk for cardiopulmonary arrest. Other issues that we could see include things like trauma, burns, cyanosis, an altered mental status or level of consciousness, seizure activity, fevers with a rash or petechia rash, little, little purple splotches, um, small purple spots, or any type of skin hemorrhage as well. You can see here that when we're trying to look at this here, you can see that the, one of the more common reasons why children will go into cardiac arrest is respiratory rest, or from a distress, pardon me, that moves into failure, which moves into cardiac failure, which leads into cardiac arrest. The other component that we look at is shock. Shock leads to cardiopulmonary failure, which leads to cardiopulmonary arrest. And same thing like a cardiac arrhythmia will lead to cardiac arrest. You can easily see that the respiratory system and their ability for them to maintain a normal functioning 
uh, cardiovascular system, or what we would have problems with in shock, can lead to cardiac arrest. So remember, respiratory problems and shock are the two big areas we must focus in on as we continue to work through our assessment and management. Your transport priority, we have urgent and non-urgent. Urgent, we would want to perform some type of rapid assessment. And again, in trauma, we find something that's an emergency, you find it, you fix it, transport immediately. Non-urgent, you again complete your focus, history, and physical exam on the scene, take your time. Uh, and then again, based on the patient's age, use a systematic approach. In major trauma, it's again, find it and fix it, and transport as quickly as possible. There is a transitional phase, and it really depends on the seriousness of the patient's condition. It's intended for those that are not acutely ill, and it's a phase of care that allows the patient to become familiar with you and your equipment. We don't always have the uh, luxury of taking that transitional phase to get the child comfortable, especially if they are critically ill or injured. So we want to assess and treat your patient in these cases using the transitional phase when it's appropriate and recognizing that if it's a critical or a significantly injured patient, we may need to skip this phase uh, in order to assure the best outcome. When we look at our secondary assessment, we have to classify this based on a medical condition or illness along with trauma. For medical, history will precede the physical exam, allows the patient to become acclimated to what you're doing, gives them a better background uh, on the information you're obtaining, uh, on the history in general, the history of the present illness, uh, and then the parent or caregiver knowledge and interactive level. If it's trauma, we're going to perform our physical exam and that will take precedence. And again, remember in trauma, we are in that find it, fix it mode, sort out the rest later. Those life-threatening issues must be managed right away. With history, um, again, it's going to focus on nature of illness or injury, truly the description of what has happened, the length of time that this is injury or illness has been uh, going over and then in every patient, is there a sign of a fever? Is there a, pres a presence of a fever or not? We want to know what effects of the illness or injury have on behavior uh, and then how does the child normally interact with people? What is their bowel and urine habits? Uh, have they had diapers as normally today? Um, what's their color? What's their smell? What's their odor? Their consistency? All those things do make a difference in our assessment. Presence of vomiting and diarrhea and then the frequency of urination. Those things are going to really help us determine uh, things like dehydration or a circulatory system uh, support. We also want to identify chronic illnesses that may be going on, medications they may be, and allergies. Even though that's limited to the population that may be having those problems, we still need to assess. We also want to see if they're under the orders of any type of uh, physician, and if they have a specific physician, who is that pediatrician? With trauma, again, we want to reconsider the mechanism of injury and remember there's a lot of things that uh, have uh, play a factor in the injuries themselves in a pediatric patient. Things like, did they have proper protective devices? Were they used properly? Restraining devices, helmets, things of that nature. Uh, how were they positioned in the vehicle? Uh, where is the damage in the vehicle if we're dealing with trauma? And then remember, they don't trauma, they don't tolerate trauma well at all. Your physical exam, uh, for the focused exam, we're going to again focus in on the area that's primarily injured. Um, for most trauma, we're going to perform a rapid trauma exam, and we would use the toe-to-head approach with younger children. Remember that they're scared, and we want to try to be as uh, non-threatening as possible. If minor injuries or illnesses, uh, pardon me, uh, injuries occur, we can still do that uh, physical exam, but we're going to more be more focused on the areas that are affected or the body systems that are affected. Remember that in trauma, always maintain a high index of suspicion for undetected internal injuries as that energy, that kinetic energy, is going to be transferred much easily, more easily through the bone. There's less protective structures, less developed muscles, all which means the internal organs are more likely to become damaged. We also are going to check things like pupils, cap refill time. It's very valuable in patients that are less than six as far as how the status of their circulatory system. We also want to know about their hydration, things like skin turgor, presence of tears or saliva, uh, and then the condition of the funnels. Pulse oximetry is going to be pretty decent information for us, um, but you need to use the appropriate sensor device, which means you need a pediatric sensor. Shock and hypothermia also can affect your pulse oximetry readings and make them uh, unreliable. Glasgow Coma Scale. Uh, we know that the scoring is going to be a little bit different for uh, pediatrics than you would see with an adult. 
Um, GCS, typically 13 to 15, is mild, moderate, 9 to 12, and severe is less than 8. This again is in volume 5, page 96 of your textbook, and here we can see uh, those that are greater than one year and those that are less than one year. Uh, very similar for eye-opening, but motor response, you can see um, they can't get uh, a total of six points based on that uh, for us when it's less uh, than one year of age because they don't have the ability to obey your motor responses. Uh, and again, verbal responses, you can see that's broken down in greater than five, two to five, and from zero to 23 months. Vital signs, uh, pulse, it's okay to note brachial from oral pulses in little ones. We don't typically use a radial pulse, very difficult to find. Um, uh, even carotids can be challenging for that matter. But brachial and from oral pulses are really good. We're going to pay close attention to respiratory rate and then blood pressure. But primarily for blood pressure, we're going to focus on children over the age of three. We also need to make sure the cuff is appropriately sized. It needs to be at least two thirds the arm width. Uh, and then hypotension can be late and oftentimes sudden. And we're also looking for ominous signs of failure. Uh, those can be things like drop in respiratory rate or drop in heart rate uh, as well. If you look at some of the vital signs that you can see, um, you can see when you're calculating a blood pressure, you're going to take their uh, approximately to get their systolic blood pressure. We're going to go ahead and take 90 divided by 2 times their age. Again, remember that you're going to have to do the please excuse my dear Aunt Sally method for solving a mathematical equation. And then the diastolic uh, pressure is going to be two-thirds of what the systolic is. So again, gives you an idea for a preschooler, somewhere between a systolic of 78 to 116 and a diastolic over about 65. Um, you can also see that heart rates, heart rates are going to be much higher when they're at rest uh, as they are when they're newborns, and as they become older, the heart rate will begin to slow down as they mature. Same thing with the respiratory rates. They're going to be faster when they're younger, and they're going to slow over time. I cannot ever remember exactly pediatric vital signs, even still to this day. Uh, so I make sure that I have a pediatric flip guide or access chart so I can reference that when I have those calls because it's very important to recognize um, the importance of the respiratory rate and their heart rate and maintaining uh, their ability to remain um, healthy, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Vital signs, again, another conversion chart you can see here. This is for pounds to kilograms. Mostly we'll use our uh, Brazil tape or the mimetic tape to determine weight, and then again use that mimetic card as a reference guide. Same thing with vital signs, you can find those in the mimetics as well. There's the example of your brachial and your femoral pulses. It makes it a little bit uh, easier for you to find those pulses, pulse points. Again, we typically stay away from radial and carotid, uh, unless it's cardiac arrest, we'll go for carotid. In non-invasive monitoring, that's your pulse ox, automatic blood pressure, self-registering uh, thermometers, EKGs, uh, all those are going to be great ways for non-invasive monitoring. Your EKG is going to be the best way for you obtaining access to a pulse. Um, and then again, you just want to make sure that once your EKG monitor is on, that you confirm that pulse matches up with those uh, corresponding QRS complexes. Your ongoing assessment is extremely important. Reassess the, uh, reassess the patient regularly because we know things can change very rapidly. Every 15 minutes for stable, every 5 minutes for unstable, and if you're not sure, just assess them every time you get a chance to. That's probably your best bet. Monitor the patient's respiratory effort, skin color, mental status, temperature, and pulse oximetry. Those big five things will point you in the direction of your patient getting better or your patient crashing. Let's dive into general management of the pediatric patient. Your top priority in treating an infant or child are airway, breathing, and circulation. Again, we use the pediatric assessment triangle, or the PAT, to do so. Again, we know that in order for us to be effective when managing patients, we have to maintain our skills throughout practice. All of your skills fall into the category of lose it, or, or from a use it or lose it. Without regular use or practice, all skills suffer and will deteriorate over time. Remember that keeping your skills up allows for you to be a good patient advocate. There are a number of BLS maneuvers in infants and children that we can see here according to the table four six in your book. Again, it's going to classify based on infants and children. Perform body area obstruction. In a responsive child, we're going to perform a series of abdominal thrusts. For a responsive Ill, uh, infant, we're going to do five back blows followed by five chest thrusts. And then visually expect the patient's airway to see if the foreign object has become clear. 
In an unresponsive child, we know that we're never going to begin a, use a blind finger sleep and attempt ventilations and chest compressions with regularly assessing uh, to see if the foreign body, body area of obstruction has been removed. Best way to know how to go from a child who needs back blows and chest thrusts to just cardiopulmonary resuscitation is when the child becomes limp. When the child becomes limp, it's important for us to go ahead and move right into cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Here again, you can see that we're opening the airway, assessing, doing a five back blows, followed by our five chest compressions, and then reassessing the patient's airway. When it comes to suctioning, we know that we need to decrease suction pressure to less than 100 millimeters of, of mercury in infants. Um, usually need to be below 30 uh, in order for it to flow, at least a minimum of 30 in order for it to flow. You're going to see these vacuum units on the wall. Pay attention with them. Get a chance to play around with them when you can. And we know that it's important for us to avoid excessive uh, suctioning time as it will increase the likelihood of hypoxia. We want to make sure that if we're suctioning that we don't stimulate the vagus nerve as that can make your patient bradycardic, affecting the cardiovascular system, and check a pulse frequently. Why? We know that hypoxia and bradycardia are the two most common reasons why children go into cardiac arrest. Catheter size you can also see in your textbook on page 72. Oxygenation is also important. It's a hallmark of pediatric management. We know that oxygen can be delivered by masks, by blow-by, by nasal cannula, all of which are appropriate depending on the situation. Airway adjuncts oftentimes can create greater complications in children than that of adults. We typically think that an OPA is just regularly used for everybody. We have to use caution when we're using it in children. Soft tissue damaging uh, during insertion or vomiting or stimulation of the vagus nerve all can play a major role in negative outcomes for your patients when we choose to use an oral pharyngeal airway. Uh, if we're going to use prolonged ventilations necessary, okay, we may want to shoot for an OPA, but preferably probably an endotracheal tube. And remember, infants and children often improve quickly through the administration of 100% oxygen. Cardiac arrest in children is most often secondary due to respiratory failure or distress. Remember, no airway, no patient. With a pediatric patient, airway is going to be the most, airway and breathing are the most common two reasons why we see a patient collapse or crash. Oral pharyngeal, we should be using a tongue blade for insertion. This can also be done with a laryngoscope blade. We would insert at the tip pointing towards the tongue and the pharynx and then apply it directly straight in as long as we're using that tongue depressor. A nasal pharyngeal, we generally do not use them on a child uh, with any type of mid-face or head trauma uh, because we know that the sinuses uh, can fracture and create a passages into the cranial hole. For ventilation, there's a couple of key things we need to recognize. One, avoid excessive bag pressure and volume. Slow ventilations with a proper size bag. Remember, the right tool the first time indicates the best outcome for that patient. Make sure you're obtaining chest rise and fall and allow time for exhalation. Remember, one breath in, two seconds out. One second in, two seconds out. Flow-restricted oxygen power devices are contraindicated. We should not use them. We had a uh, opportunity to play around with those during our pig lung and heart dissection. Uh, you can see the damage that can happen because of those. And then do not use BVMs with pop-off valves. We want to have a limiting device that may open and prevent inadequate oxygenation uh, during, again, kids have high pulmonary pressures, making it more likely that that pop-off valve will go off and less oxygenation and ventilation will begin into your patient. And then remember, keep their head in a neutral alignment. Avoid hyperextension of the neck. With ventilation, the right mask is important. We have to have a properly sized mask in order to ensure a good fit. It needs to fit on the bridge of the nose, covers the cleft of the chin, as you can see denoted in the image below. It's also important that we use the right size bag valve mask. Yes, we can use a larger mask for a smaller child, but we want to make sure that we don't overventilate either. That can lead to gastric distension and regurgitation, all of uh, making our, our ventilations less effective. For advanced airway and ventilatory management, the success of these uh, skills and techniques require you to have knowledge of the procedures that set pediatrics apart. We know that things like foreign body airway obstruction or the use of the McGill forceps to remove a body of obstruction, a needle crike, endotracheal innovation, and rapid sequence induction or innovation are also extremely important during this process. For foreign body airway obstructions, we know the child cannot clear their airway by any type of basic procedures 
so we must visualize the airway and remove the foreign body with our laryngoscope and McGill forceps. If unable to remove, we want to try to intubate around it. If we can't do that, then we've used all of our other methods, so a needle crike in this case is indicated. Now, direct oral tracheal innovation allows for direct visualization of the lower airway through the trachea. It is the most effective way of maintaining a patient's airway. But typically, mistaken sized or misplaced tubes can obviously lead to hypoxia and to death. So remember that these guys have a little reserve capacity and a very high metabolic demand. That means they don't tolerate hypoxia for very long before they crash. Now, with anatomical and phys physiological considerations or concerns, when it comes to innovation, a straight blade is generally preferred for the displacement of the tongue. This is because of the likelihood of stimulating the vagus nerve if we were to use like a MAC blade or a curved blade. Proper sizing of the endotracheal tube is crucial as well. You should check to make sure that you're using the right piece of equipment for that patient. Remember, the right tool the first time. We also should use a resuscitation tape like a Braslow tape or a mimetic tape to help ensure a proper size of equipment uh, and a proper weight-based dosing of medications. We can also go ahead and estimate the diameter of the tube by using the patient's pinky finger, or this formula becomes important. For the patient's age and years, we add 16, and then we can divide that by 4, and that will give us the tube size. We know the depth of insertion should not be any further on beyond the radiographic tape line that's on the endotracheal tube, or just until the uh, cuff on the, on the endotracheal tube uh, disappears. Remember, it should just go one to two centimeters below uh, the vocal cord uh, per our test bank. Here again is a table 4A airway management and pediatric equipment guidelines. You can see where you would need to use this as far as uh, the right tool um, for the airway uh, management that you're looking for. And then we also have table 4.9, which is going to have to do with the depth of the insertion of the endotracheal tube. Again, it kind of gives you an idea uh, from 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. Uh, 22 is where we would typically see for an adult. Other concerns we have, cuffed or, un cuffed or uncuffed endotracheal tubes can be used in children, but not neonates. Um, uncuffed tubes only in neonates. Uh, and then when am I called a neonate? Oh, that's right, uh, right for after birth. Uh, infants and small children may have a greater vagal response, again, compared to adults, because it doesn't take much to stimulate that uh, reflex uh, for vomiting or for um, the trigeminal nerve to increase bradycardia. There are some indications that we have for endotracheal intubation, just to kind of review from our airway lecture quite some time ago. Uh, we know that the, we would be indicated if there was a need for prolonged artificial ventilation, uh, inability for us to adequately use a bag valve mask or be able to get a proper seal, cardiac or respiratory arrest, uh, control of an airway in a patient without a cough or gag reflex, and then providing a route for drug administration only secondary to that of peripheral or interosseous uh, infusions. And then access to the airway for suctioning as well. Again, reference your local protocols if you're able to innovate as a first-line treatment in the pre-hospital setting or if it is a uh, only post-radio. Obviously, one of the things that we're going to do first before we get started is to ventilate the child to ensure that we have adequate oxygenation stores and reserves as we prepare for the innovation. We're going to prepare all of our equipment to make sure that we're ready to go. The patient is already going to be hyperoxygenated, um, and then now we're prepared to go ahead and intubate. As we prepare to intubate, we're going to do this for no more than 30 seconds and be prepared uh, again to provide oxygenation in between attempts if necessary. We're going to insert the laryngoscope into the child. We're going to take a look at what we can see. Um, we're going to visualize the larynx, perform suction as necessary. Um, if you think it's going to be a difficult intubation, again, most commonly it is with children because their larynx is more anterior uh, and then more superior and more of a funnel shape, making it all that much harder to see. Uh, we may have to do some padding and things of that. So you may visualize and then actually back out if needed need to um, before you would go ahead and visualize the larynx again and then pass the endotracheal tube through. We're going to ventilate and also tape and then confirm tube placement by slapping our capnography uh, paying close attention to equal chest rise and fall, lung sounds, uh, things of that nature uh, to determine that we have proper tube placement. Remember, tube size really does matter in these kids, and if we undersize a tube, we can easily have uh, problems associated with hypoxia. And that matter also tube displacement. 
From there, we're going to secure the tube and then again continuously reconfirm tube placement. Every time we move our patient, we're going to reconfirm that we have it you know, properly established. Now for confirming, we're going to visualize, right, to see the tube passing through the vocal cords, equal chest rise and fall, even condensation in the tube can be a, a decent tool uh, for confirming. But remember, there's more to it than that. We also want to oscillate to see if we have any sounds in the epigastrum or in the lungs. Um, it makes sure they can't speak if they're we can be able to speak. Uh, and then obviously, 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 slap that capnography. For endotracheal innovation, um, and adjuncts to confirm, we know that esophageal detecting devices uh, may be very inaccurate in pediatric patients. Pulse oximetry only looks backwards, uh, doesn't necessarily look forward, but capnography will be the pref preferred method um, to confirm and to continuously monitor uh, your proper tube placement and your patient's uh, status. Remember, uh, continuous waveform capnography is the golden standard. Um, remember that for um, Endotracheal innovation, we also have to be extremely vigilant uh, about repeatedly or continuously monitoring proper endotracheal tube placement. That's extremely important, right? Remember that rapid deterioration and innovation patient, you should dope. Dope is an acronym, right? Something's wrong, dope. We're going to work at displacement of the tube, obstruction, maybe mucus or blood, maybe it's a pneumothorax from bowel trauma, or do we have some type of equipment failure, a kink in the tube? A pinch line, oxygen tubing is not plugged in properly. Take a look at, take a look at it from that perspective. Excuse me, that perspective. For rapid sequence innovation, we know it's indicated in pediatrics where innovation is difficult due to combativeness or clenched teeth. We're going to use a neuromuscular uh, compliance uh, medication in order to, uh, in the form of a paralytic, to paralyze. Typically, we would use succinylcholine, as it's a depolarizing non-muscular uh, blocking agent. Uh, probably neuromuscular blocking agent. Um, dose for that typically is one to two milligrams per kilogram IV push, and the onset is rather short of one to two minutes, but it only lasts for about six. Again, from there, we're also going to go ahead and do our sedative administrations, which could be Versed, Valium, fentanyl, uh, ketamine, you name it. We also need to make sure that if we're considering RSI, that we have a backup air rescue airway. This could be an LMA, could be an eye gel. Uh, anything of those fashions, but PEDS uh, rescue airways are a lot more difficult to come by uh, than a primary endotracheal tube. Nasogastric intubation, um, it is indicated occasionally where we have the inability to achieve adequate tidal volume during ventilation due to gastric distension. Um, we may want to go ahead and have, uh, relieve that uh, pressure if possible with a nasogastric tube. We'll get to that in a second. But realistically, we know that as the uh, belly fills with air, it's going to push up on the diaphragm, decreasing your overall tidal volume, um, making uh, ventilations less effective. Remember that the presence of gastric distension in unresponsive patient is critical, and that there's a risk of vomiting or aspiration uh, with an uncontrolled airway. If we're going to go ahead and put a nasal gastric tube in, um, we're going to need to make sure we measure it properly, um, and then go ahead and place that appropriately. Here you can see the oxygenation um, and uh, continuous ventilation if possible. You're going to measure the nasogastric tube from the tip of the nose over and around the ear and down to the xiphoid process. That's going to give you the best uh, angle from there. You can then go ahead and lubricate the distal end of the tube and then pass it gently downward along the nasal floor into the stomach. It's really important that you get it into the right location. So as you do that, once it's in, you're going to oscillate over the stomach uh, to confirm correct placement by injecting 10 to 20 cc's of air into the tube. Don't use fluid because if you're in the lungs, you don't want fluid in the lungs. But air, you should be able to hear gurgle, gurgle as you listen and oscillate over the epigastrum. And then from there, you can use suction uh, to go ahead and aspirate any type of stomach, stomach contents or the air that's in there out. Again, make sure that you do this according to your local protocols and guidelines for scope of practice. Once the tube is in place properly, the NG tube, you then can secure it properly uh, with tape. For circulation, we know that there's two primary problems that lead to cardiopulmonary arrest in children. Shock, and the big one, respiratory failure. We also know that end organ changes uh, indicate an, uh, the effectiveness of respiratory in the cardiovascular system. So there's three main things that you're going to want to assess for. The first is mental status, skin color and temperature, and the third one is urine output. 
And remember, if you do your ICU uh, rotations, you're going to find that urine output is critical for any of those patients that are in the ICU. Remember, normal is one to two milliliters per kilogram per hour. As far as vascular access goes, we're going to pay close attention to uh, access of neck veins, uh, the scalp veins, arms, hands, feet, and then obviously the interosseous infusion. Our goal is to be able to go ahead and use some type of uh, uh, location uh, that's going to give us the quickest access uh, that's going to be the most stable for that patient long term. Generally speaking, that's going to be interosseous for critical patients unless we can easily obtain peripheral, peripheral, peripheral. peripheral access. We know the interosseous infusion, large volumes of fluid may be administered, and again it's going to be a direct access into the vasculature. Drugs can also be administered uh, through interosseous infusion as well. Now when we're performing these interosseous infusion, we have to recognize when it's appropriate to place an IL. Uh, the primary indications for an I.O. include existence of shock or cardiac arrest, unresponsive patient, or unsuccessful attempts at a peripheral IV insertion. We also know that there are contraindications, and there are some primary contraindications for an I.O. as well. These include things like the presence of a fracture in bone that you're choosing to use the infusion in, fractures of the pelvis or extremity fractures in the bone that's proximal to the chosen site, above the site, and what would happen if I ignore these rules and place an I.O. anyways? Well, they're just not going to work. And again, I need that lifeline in order to provide that life-saving medication or fluids. Drugs that can be administered by IO, really they're all there. You can see there is no specific list per the state protocol. Um, uh, if you need to give a drug, you should be able to give it without any problem through an IO. When we do the placement of the needle into the marrow cavity, it can be determined by the lack of resistance or a popping type feel that you may find. And then upon aspiration, you may see blood or bone marrow, and the needle should, for the most part, stand freely. Some of the tools that we use, including this guy right here, which is a, considered to be a, a Jamshetty I.O. needle, um, are a lot less effective than having an uh, easy I.O. or a drill-like I.O. gun. They do work, they are effective, but oftentimes we may fracture the bone, we may bend the needle, or we may slip uh, and cause more tissue damage uh, than we actually do with obtaining access. Fluid administration, we know that the accurate dosing of fluid in children is crucial to their survivability. The initial dose of 20 mLs per kilogram of an isotonic solution is always appropriate, and we can reassess them to see if we need to repeat it as necessary. State protocol will allow for you to do it up to a total of 40, milligrams, 40 milliliters per kilogram. So basically you can do two 20 mLs per kilogram full bolses. A mini drip administration set or a micro drip set um, or flow limiters or infusion pumps should regularly be used when we're dealing with pediatric cases. Fluid tonicity, we've talked about these before early on. We talked about hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic solutions. Hypertonic solutions are things like D10 or anything greater than 0.9% sodium chloride. We also know that like a 1% um, saline solution can also be considered. Isotonic solution is going to be our 0.9% sodium chloride um, or we're going to be dealing with our lactated ringers. Those are our two primary forms of uh, fluid that we would use as an isotonic solution. A hypertonic solution would be things like D5W, 0.45% uh, sodium chloride, uh, or anything less than 0.9% sodium chloride. And you can see what happens if we're dealing with hypotonic versus a hypertonic. A hypertonic solution is going to draw the net movement of water out of the cell. Isotonic keeps it balanced. A hypertonic, you can see where we actually are going to pull fluid into the cells, actually moving fluid out of their vascular system, and then to the point where those cells can actually lice open and break, uh, leaking their fluid out, no longer having a healthy cell that can perform its normal functions. So remember, we're going to shoot for those isotonic crystalloid solutions. Medications, the major aim in a pediatric resuscitation is airway management and ventilation. 
There are a lot of medications that can be used, and you can find that in your textbook on page 102 and 103. You can see all those different components that are there. It is critical that you begin to commit to memory the common pediatric medication administrations, not only for your registry exam, but for your field practice. And remember, when in doubt, look it up. Don't sit there and guess. Make informed decisions. It's better to take time to look something up, to know you're accurate, than it is to provide too little or too much of a medication. With electrical therapy, for defibrillation, we know that the initial dose of two to four joules per kilogram is indicated. You may have to pull those field guides out if you need to. And the secondary shocks can be at four and continue on. <coughs> if they're still unsuccessful, focus on correcting the hypoxia and the acidosis. Remember, transport a patient um, is, uh, to a critical care unit if possible if you're needing for excessive electrical therapy units. For cardioversion, you'd be working at one to two joules per kilogram. For C-spine immobilization, most of the time we know now that kids are not necessarily provided uh, or transported in full spinal immobilization precautions. This is generally because of the trauma that can happen. It's also important to recognize the mechanism of injury with peds. They have an eight pound bowling ball, that's about what, how much their head will weigh, sitting on the top of a pencil. It's not gonna balance there very well without causing some problems. So we need to make sure that we're aware that the injury can still occur, even though we may not provide full spinal immobilization. We also need to make sure that we'll, when we're using any type of equipment in a pediatric patient, especially for cervical trauma, that we use the appropriate size immobilization equipment. Things that we may also need to do is some good old stuff and fluff technique, padding, elevate the shoulders, pad behind the exhibit, maintain a neutral alignment, keeping their head into a sniffing position, all depending on their age, and their needs. We also want to try to minimize their emotional uh, distress. If we're putting them in all these devices, we need to make sure that we interact with them, that we keep them calm, keep mom or dad or parent or caregiver close by. Transport guidelines, there's three things that we need to really consider, three major factors. One, the time of transport, how long is it going to take for us to get there? Is there specialized facilities that we may need to transport to? Or is there specialized personnel that we need to get to? Again, remember, we want to get them to the most appropriate facility early on. Know where your pediatric patients' care centers are. And remember, reassure the child. We interact with them regularly because in order for them to be comfortable and to be able to trust you and for the parent or caregiver to trust you, communication is of the utmost importance. So that includes our lecture on the introduction to the pediatric patient. We've discussed the role of the paramedic in pre pediatric care, We've talked about general approaches to the assessment and general pediatric emergencies, along with the management for general emergency care. I hope this lesson has been helpful, and we'll catch you guys here on the next one.